The coronavirus continues to rage across the world, with total infections around the globe now having topped 75 million. Amid the colder season, COVID-19 seems to be spreading faster than ever, especially in the United States and Europe, where they have recently started vaccinations for medical workers, the elderly and those most vulnerable to the disease. The world is watching to see just how effectively and safely the jab is being administered and the possible side effects. The vast majority of their populations, of course, won't be eligible to get the vaccine until weeks or months later. So what happens between now and then? For this, we turn to Albert Coe, Department Chair and Professor of Epidemiology and of Medicine at Yale University. He's leading Connecticut's response to COVID-19 as the co-chair of the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group and continues to serve as an advisor to the governor on the pandemic. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Coe. It's, as always, it's wonderful to have you again. Thank you very much, Sue Young. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be back again. Well, let's go straight into the question. So this very exciting news about the vaccine rollout in America. Um, after the Moderna vaccine became the second COVID-19 vaccine to be authorised for emergency use, trucks have begun uh, distributing the doses to more than 3,700 locations on Sunday. And uh, while well, the question is, is there a difference between the Moderna and uh, Pfizer vaccines for the patients who take it? And of course, the AstraZeneca one could be... Um, authorized quite soon as well. So do certain patients respond to a particular type of vaccine better than others? So, so Sue Young, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, these surely have been major public health success stories. Uh, these two vaccines have both been approved. They are both what we call the mRNA vaccine. And they work in a very similar uh, manner in terms of um, priming the immune response and providing pr protection. They aren't exactly the same. Some of the components are a little bit different, but they use work using the same mechanism and, and both have been shown to give high protection. It's unclear when the, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine will be approved. There's some questions that I'm sure regulators are gonna ask about how the trials were conducted. And, it, and at this point, we really don't know how these vaccines work, you know, uh, work you know, whether they work better in one group of pop, uh, one population group better than another. There haven't been those head-to-head -head com um, comparisons. Those will happen once the vaccines are rolled out. But at least at this point, what we know is that the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccines are highly effective based on the results from the clinical trial. Well, Dr. Ko, for now, we've heard a couple of reports about uh, people having allergic reactions after taking the Pfizer vaccine. Um, what are the uh, possible side effects that we could see? And are these something that we should be really worried about? Well, we learned a lot about you know, types of side effects people have during these very large trials. These are trials of 30, 40,000 people that were done you know, with the AstraZeneca, I'm sorry, with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. Most of the side effects are very mild, you know, pain at the site of injection where the immunization is administered, sometimes some fatigue, maybe a little low-grade fever, uh, some, you know, body, body fatigue. Um, in a small number, percentage of people, less than 10%, they get more moderate or severe symptoms with a, with a, uh, a stronger headache or a fever. Uh, however, all of these symptoms actually go away within 24, 48 hours. Uh, there has been concern, as you mentioned, about the allergic reactions. And, and we're particularly most concerned about these severe allergic reactions, Type of allergic reactions you get when you have, you know, get a, a bad food allergy or you get stung by a bee, and this is called anaphylaxis. And there were two cases that were reported in, Uni in the United Kingdom, and there's also one other case that was reported in the United States in a healthcare worker who received the vaccine in, in, in Alaska. However, at least from what we know now, and, and tens of thousands of people have been vaccinated, and that these these events are very rare and surely now you know the the benefits of these vaccines outweigh these, these rare risks and as rare as these side effects or allergic reactions may be there's a surprisingly large number of people who say that they won't get the vaccine because the drugs were uh, developed in record time and also there's news of a new uh, strain of the disease in the uk i mean do you think these people have a point and uh, what would you have to say to these people and what should really be done to get them on board in taking the vaccine yeah no so Su young you know we've seen something just you know um breathtaking you know over the less than a year 
uh, since the pandemic started, you know, in a large, unprecedented international, you know, um, response. You know, these vaccines have been developed from scratch. They were placed through clinical trials, and now they've at least, you know, one, two of them have been approved, at least by the um, United States Food and Drug Administration. Uh, you know, but I, what I would say to to the people who raise those concerns, those concerns are valid. All of us want a safe and effective vaccine. And I think the best way to kind of address those concerns is with evidence and with science and with the facts. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the, you know, the tens of thousands of people have been vaccinated. Um, you know, we've learned a lot about the side effects. Side effects. Most of the side effects are mild. Um, and it very rarely does um, a severe adverse reaction occur, you know, such, a, such as anaphylaxis. And so this is really, you know, this, the evidence we have right now shows that these vaccines are, you know, are safe and they're also highly effective. Uh, I think, you know, uh, again, you know, I think we're, we have to acknowledge that these are emergency responses to a pandemic. We're going to be learning a lot as these, as many uh, large parts of our population you know, throughout the world are vaccinated. We're going to be learning more about them. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I think, you know, people who are raising these concerns should be reassured that really the, the best minds, both in research and both in public health, really focused on the idea of making sure that this vaccine and this public health success story translates into something that is both safe and effective for, for the uh, global population. Meanwhile, Dr. Ko, the number of daily COVID-19 cases are continuing to hit record highs in countries like the United States, the UK and even South Korea. And it seems that the virus is spreading faster than before and more people are, are being hospitalised. Is this mostly due to our actions or lack of caution, or is it that the virus is actually getting stronger? Well, so, Su Young, you know, we, we certainly have learned a lot uh, since the pandemic started, you know, last, uh, actually last December, a year ago. And what we know is that, you know, this virus spreads by person to person. Uh, certain types of behavior, human behavior, is drive transmission, you know, people especially these super spreading events that happen in large gatherings. And, and, you know, so surely human behavior is a major driving factor for the spread. And this is actually ever more critical in the winter months when it gets cold, people are inside their homes, uh, gatherings of people are in places with, you know, whether it's in a restaurant or in a cafe or, you know, the, where there's not ventilation and there can be, there's a lot of close contact. Um, I think much of the transmission the increase that we're seeing throughout the world, particularly in Europe and in, in the United States and even parts of parts of Asia is being fueled at this moment because of those dynamics of, of human behavior. Now, we're certainly concerned about mutations that may occur and mutations that may give a benefit to the virus in terms of transmission or even becoming more pathogenic and causing disease. We, I think one thing that we have to understand is that this virus, like all living things, you know, mutation is part of its natural life. Uh, mutations occur spontaneously. Not all mutations are bad mutations. Not all mutations will make a virus become more transmissible or more pathogenic. Um, and I think the jury's out right now. Uh, we are concerned that there are certain strains that have certain mutations are spreading more rapidly in places like the United Kingdom, as well as uh, South Africa and maybe parts of Europe. Uh, but, you know, at this point, and we're going to need to do more studies, more research, and particularly laboratory experiments to understand if these viruses are spreading because people are spreading them, or they're spreading because they've actually had picked up a mutation that gives them a selective advantage. Those type of experiments uh, need to be done and are being done at this moment. Well, some countries, uh, they haven't been able to procure as many doses of the COVID-19 vaccines as uh, initial supplies have mostly been bought by a lot of Western countries. And even now, without, uh, even, now even if they have enough finances, is it difficult to get a deal with the uh, major drug makers at this point? And um, if so, then how long do you think other parts of the world would have to actually wait to be vaccinated? So, Su Young, you, know, you raise a, really an, an important issue, an important global issue. 
Um, you know, obviously there have been you know successes, and you can say victories on the part of the research and development. That's that's actually one small step in really making this, a, you know, uh, an action of public health impact. And the, that second part is making sure that we don't leave anyone behind in the wor world's population to benefit from this vaccine. And that means getting the vaccine out not only to people in the United States or the, you know, the uh, wealthier countries in the European Union or the rest rest of the world, but even all the countries, including the lower middle income countries. That's really important because this vaccine, this virus is not going to go away. It's highly transmissible. We are going to continue living our lives with this virus. So the vaccine is going to be key in order to controlling that. So it doesn't create the mortality and morbidity that we've experienced in the pandemic. On that note, you know, I think that's why initiatives, and there's one important initiative, you know, supported by the uh, WHO, World Health Organization, which is COVAX which is trying to broker negotiations between companies and countries such that these vaccines are actually, you know, available and accessible, you know, even among our poor, poorest countries. And that's going to take in buy-in, and that's going to take in a global response and not a bilateral response. Uh, and in, in, at this point, I think one of the things that I'm disappointed in is that it's everybody is out for themselves. All countries are out trying to procure their own supplies. And we have to really think of a more unified and uh, multilateral global response. And as new stats, the COVAX Alliance is very underfunded at the moment, and they need a lot of a lot more funding for these uh, drugs to be able to be distributed more evenly across all countries. And well, for now, uh, Western nations, they well, the United States, for instance, they previously uh, they've uh, flouted the idea of um, having. Um, 70% of the population vaccinated by the spring. And if everything goes on schedule, then um, then would they finally be able to take their masks off? I mean, how will authorities determine that the pandemic is over? And until the virus stops circulating, what measures should we really keep in place in cities, at work, and also in daily life? So, so Young, let me go back to your previous point, because that was a very important point. And that's a point of global, global equity and global justice. Um, you know, we will not be able to, you know, defeat this virus. And uh, we'll never eliminate it. We won't reduce the mortality, morbidity caused this virus unless the world's population is, is vaccinated. And, you know, the, and it, you know, the big concern is that initiatives such as COVAX are un underfunded. And I think the rich countries, has, you know, need to think that very clearly that their own public health are really involved, affected by the public health of, of poorer countries. And that's essentially important because how transmissible this virus is. You can stamp it out in one place, but if it is it still transmission still occurring in other per parts of the world, and particularly the poorer parts, we will have continued reintroduction. So it is in the benefit of everybody, not only the poor countries, but the rich countries that the whole world is vaccinated. So what do we do until then? Um, so I think one of the things, and I, I think uh, my, my, my personal opinion is not as optimistic as yours. I think in the United States here, it's probably going to be, it's going to take us until the second part of this year to vaccinate the majority of Americans. Uh, the first two phases, which are healthcare workers, essential workers, and people with high risk of severe complications of COVID, it's going to take us the first four to six months to vaccinate those. And that's only that part of the U.S. population. And that's only a small proportion. The rest of the general population are going to have to wait until the end, and towards the uh, middle to the end of, of next year. So even in the United States, this is going to take uh, some time, and I suspect in many of parts of the world, and particularly the more vulnerable parts, you know, of um, of the globe, in the lower middle income countries, it's going to take several years, unfortunately, to reach that. So in the meantime, and, and this becomes ever more urgent during this winter season, wherever you are in in the world, especially in the northern hemisphere, where we're having these large epidemics, you know, with the cold weather that we need to still rely on kind of the ABCs of public health prevention, and that's using face masks, reducing gathering sizes to prevent super spreading, and to, and to um, you know, and when needed, to prevent social contact, whether it's through lockdown 
you know, severe lockdowns as the UK is doing, which parts of the United States are doing, or restricted, more targeted, focused uh, lockdowns, such as South Korea is doing, and many other many other countries effectively. So really, it sounds like the virus will be with us for most of next year, and I hope the authorities, really, um, the public health authorities government leaders they really uh, get that message out very concisely and clearly um, instead of making it sound like the virus I mean the vaccine will provide a one shot or I suppose in this case two shot uh, solution to the problem but I'm afraid this is the t all the time we have uh, today for this discussion but thank you so much that was Albert Coe department chair and professor of epidemiology and of medicine at Yale University joining us from New Haven thank you again so much for your time it's an honor as always to have you on our show. Thank you very much, Sujia. And to our viewers as always, thank you for watching.